I want to say it's, it's really an honor to come here. I've heard of GTAC before. Um, I've uh, heard of the company Google a couple times before. Uh, and it's, I mean, it's really, it's really a pleasure to come here. And i tell you something that was, that's really been exciting is I found that every single talk yesterday was interesting and I learned something. And that's, I, I wasn't so sure that would be true coming from, you know, as, a, as an academic researcher coming to a more industrial conference. But it's been fascinating. Good, good talks, very interesting subjects. I took a bunch of notes of things I want to look at as potential future research problems. So really, I want to get through my talk quickly. I've cut out a lot of slides because I want to sit down and listen to the rest of you all. Um, the talk after mine, by the way, is fascinating by a, a brilliant young scientist uh, who, by the way, has had a great education. Um, I'll tell you more about that later. So when, I, when, when Google first asked me to uh, to come to, to uh, GTAC, I said, well, here are a couple of things I might talk about. And they said, well, this one isn't very interesting. Uh, and this one is, and this one is. Can you do both? And so I thought, well, can you give me three or four hours? And they said, no, only James Whitaker gets, gets three or four hours at GTAC. Um, um, so they said, but you need to combine those and also fit it into, fit it into an hour. So I, th I think I've done that. At least I've done the first part. Um, the other thing that's really pleasing to me is on the plane over here, I was looking at my slides and I was thinking, there's one part that I'll get to in a few minutes that I thought, well, a lot of testers aren't going to get this because it's fairly technical, low level, really relies on program analysis that you know, requires a lot of programming knowledge. And then yesterday I thought, geez, I should add more to that section because that may be the most interesting part of, of the talk for, for a lot of you. You know, I do want to make one other point, by the way. My book has never been recycled into diapers, either for children or, or adults. Um, I'm proud to say that. <clears throat> it was printed on recycled paper, and I'm not sure where they got that paper, by the way. Now, I have some clue now. <laughs> so let, let me get to it. Um, so the, there are kind of two real ideas I'm going to talk about. One is more related to web apps than, than the other, um, and there really is this section three and, and five in my mini outline. Um, and I'm going to start off with some motivation. I think as a lot of people in here are testers, you probably don't need a lot of motivation. You may have seen some of these. But then again, some of you may be able to uh, do what I do, which is steal some of the, some, some of the facts and use them to, to motivate other people for what you're doing. If nothing else, there's some, some interesting stories, some things to think about. So I've been. Uh, doing this for a while. My, I finished my PhD in 88, and that was on the subject of testing. Uh, and what was frustrating in the 90s was I always felt like I was teaching something or selling something that most people didn't really care about. Because in the 90s, it, 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 this quality of your testing didn't really have a big impact on the bottom line for most companies. right? It was not really competitive. But in the 21st century, we're going through major changes. And that's pretty exciting to, to somebody like me. Um, a big change is we have a lot of things in our civilization that are being controlled by software. And that's pretty exciting. And because it's sort of controlling fundamental infrastructure, it has to be really good. The other thing is compared to the 80s and 90s, we have a much bigger market. It's more competitive. We have a lot more users. You know, there are maybe a few million back when I finished my PhD. Now there are several billion. I don't, there are something like six billion people in the world. I don't know what percentage of them using software on a constant basis, but it's way more than half. It's, it's very high. Another thing that's, that I think is really interesting is how often we put software in places that we don't really think about. So I have this little thing. I have this, this little thing is software. And, um, you know, I gave up my slides a few minutes ago, this is, there's a fair amount of software on here. Then I was thinking in my room last night, I was thinking about what I brought with me. Um, well, don't laugh. I'm a bit old school in some ways. So this is an old Palm Pilot. It was, it was good when I, when I got it. It still works. A lot of software embedded in there. Um, I have to listen to music, especially on, you know, 
17-hour plane rides. Uh, my phone, of course, which is, it's not a very smart phone, but there's still a lot, of, a lot of software in there. I brought a camera. Um, this even has some software, so if my hand's shaking, it will still take a decent picture. Um, that's pretty clever embedded software. And then I realized even, even this brick to power up my computer, it's got some very clever software that allows, that, that converts 240 into 120 volts, so when I travel abroad. So if you just think of, look in your pockets and think about all the software you have, it's probably more than we had an entire world 30 years ago. <clears throat> and all of that software has to work very well because it's not the software that we're caring about. It's the device that it's embedded in. And then the, one of the big changes in the field now is agile processes. And I'm like a lot of people, I'm still kind of open-minded whether agile processes are going to work or not. But one thing I know is it puts testing front and center. And from my perspective, that's a good thing. So we're, we're in the middle of a revolution. And it's changing, dramatically changing, what testing does to the success of the software and the bottom line of companies. And that's very exciting to uh, somebody like me who's been a researcher for years and an educator in, in, in software. And now a good friend of mine named Mark Harmon, I'm not sure if you can see that down there, um, gave me this quote, and I just love this quote, that we have a civilization with the skin now, and the skin is software. And you think about, just think about the amount of software it took for us to travel from our homes to Hyderabad, uh, to make reservations, airplane reservations, to get our luggage here, to check in at the hotel, to check in at, at the airplane. Even, I mean, I drove to my airport with a car that has over 100 chips on it. It's a skin that surrounds us all the time. And I just thought that that was a wonderful metaphor for what software is doing. And all that software has to work well. Here's a, a kind of a scary example of what happens when the software doesn't work very well. So this is uh, Airbus 319. And I got this example from a friend of mine, Mary Jean Harold, who was actually on a plane when this happened once. Um, the pilots were up in front of the plane flying from, this was from Atlanta to London. So somewhere over the North Atlantic, in the middle of the night, they lost their autopilot. Okay, that's an inconvenience, but they, could, they still can fly planes without auto, autopilot. Then they lost their flight deck lighting and the intercom, which is pretty disturbing. Uh, then the next thing that happens is they lost their flight and navigation displays. <clears throat> and if you've ever been driving on a dark road and you turn off your lights, you can imagine what that feels like when everything goes black especially when you're out in the middle of the ocean in the middle of the night. So what do you think the pilots did? Any guesses? <laughs> pilots are trained not to panic easily. So I hope they, <laughs> those are the planes we don't know what happened. <laughs> Any other guesses? Yeah. <laughs> that, that would be a good idea. I think the, the Air Force pilots would do that. No, actually they did the same thing that you and I do when our computer screen goes blank. They uh, held the button down, <clears throat> and then they prayed. I don't know if they're Christian, Muslim, atheists, but I know they prayed because they're flying a glider in the middle of the night over a, a very cold ocean with 500 lives behind them. And they pushed the button, and indeed the software came back up, and everything worked fine, and they made an announcement to the passengers, um, we're sorry for the inconvenience, for the interruption to your in-flight entertainment service, uh, we will try to put, put your movie back where it was when we had the slight interruption. Um, and most of the passengers never, never knew what happened. This has happened on this plane uh, several dozen times in the past few years, and they still haven't solved the problem, but they know it's software. But they haven't solved it. So the manual now for this plane has a, has a page that says how to recognize this problem and what to do. And I'm not sure if the manual includes the prayer, because I don't think it's actually necessary at that point. But... But, but they have that in there. Last night, by the way, I, I read a, a short article online. Nissan is recalling several million cars. Why? Because of a software problem. So that was, that was just announced yesterday. Uh, here's some other software failures that have been documented with uh, some money attached to some of them. So there's this NIST, NIST is a US government agency, National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, they did this detailed study and found that we're throwing away billions of dollars every year because of bad software. Uh, 
And they estimated that if we just tested better, we could cut that in half. That's a fair amount of money. <clears throat> Some of you may remember that this was northeast of uh, North America, around the Great Lakes region. It started in Canada and propagated all around the Great Lakes. It was a small software error that caused, that in the alarm system, that caused, that caused one power station to go offline and that propagated and cost, uh, I think it was something on the order of 30 or 40 million of millions dollars damage to, to various systems. This, one of my favorites is this. Do we have any peop, anybody from Amazon here? Yeah, this was great. One of my friends got a bonus with this. So it was a buy one, get one free offer, except there's an if statement that was written backwards. So if you applied a coupon to get one free, you could still get the second one free. So I had a friend, uh, was actually a student, who actually got two items like that. I don't know how much they lost. Probably not that much because I'm sure they fixed it quickly. But that's, it's a very small thing. Um, a big sea change occurred in 2007. So Symantec tracks software security vulnerabilities. It has for many years. And they found that in 2007 we crossed the line. Most security vulnerabilities are now due to software errors, not the network problems or database or cryptography. It's now software. So if you don't test your software, you can't have secure software. And then there are these estimates about Financial services and credit card sales applications where, and this is just in the USA, by the way, these losses every hour, millions of dollars, and that's passed on to consumers. So I don't really know what the worldwide monetary loss is, but it's staggering, and it's probably between a 5 to 10% drain on the world economy just because of bad software. Now, who can, who can improve the situation? It's people like you. Right? I can only have a mild influence. People actually do things that, that can make a big difference. So how do we do this? This is a, an idea that came uh, to me out of, out of the, uh, the textbook I wrote. And this is really a process kind of view. And I'm going to talk about this briefly and then say how we, how we fit the more technical aspects of testing in here. So this, this may look a little bit strange. I'm going to walk you through this graph. <clears throat> we, I look at testing as... Activities that we perform down here, I call the implementation abstraction level, and up here at the design abstraction level. So we take some software artifact. It may be the source code. It may be a UML design document or requirements or a user manual. Or some, something that describes something about the software. Lots of artifacts can be used to test from. Um, and we go through some analysis and we create some model, a graph or logical expression, something along that. We actually have four models we define, then we apply some engineering principles to create requirements on our tests that say our tests have to do something, has to cover every edge in, in a graph, for example. So those requirements are the describe how the test should be designed. We also have this sort of other path where we look at our software and we use a human-based approach uh, to develop test requirements that are separate. And the interesting thing is you, these different kinds of approaches will detect different kinds of faults. And there are some faults you can't really get to with criteria, and there are some faults that you'll never get to with the human-based approach. A human-based approach, if you only use that, will also tend to yield lots and lots of tests and fairly inefficient testing. Those tests are sometimes refined into something more detailed, depending on exactly what, those, what the requirements look like. Then we generate values, and that comes back down out of this design abstraction level, is what I call it. So that's where we get actual values. Up here, we're essentially doing math, um, just like real engineers, right? A civil engineer uses al mostly algebra and calculus to model things about structures, like a building, or a dam, or a lake, and, or an airplane, and then they use those models, those, that, those calculus models of, of, of the artifact they're trying to build, to do all sorts of things, compute what kind of materials are needed, what safety is, security issues, etc. This is the same kind of approach. It's really traditional engineering using mathematical structures up here to do some of our design work in an abstract way. It makes it more efficient. Then we, once we have the test values, we add some additional values, largely to satisfy the kind of controllability and observability issues that 
that Bob talked about yesterday. We automate those into test scripts, execute them, evaluate them, and the results down here will provide feedback. Up here, we need more tests, or maybe we need fewer tests, so we need better tests. So, so there's that, that kind of feedback loop through here. These, these activities, it turns out, can be grouped fairly readily in, into, a, into a couple of, into a few categories. Test design at the top, test automation down here, test execution, and then test evaluation. And so what we're doing by this separation is we're separating the tasks into different kinds of activities that can be performed by different kinds of people. And the interesting part is the kind of knowledge and skills you need to do the test design up here are very different from the kind of knowledge and skills you need to do test automation. And that's very different from the kind of knowledge and skills you need to execute and evaluate the results of the tests. Okay, so we need different people to do those. And in any test organization, if you take someone who's really good at this, test automation, and have that person design tests, you're probably not going to get good tests. You're not going to have a happy, uh, a happy employee. And you're going to waste a lot of resources. So that's just pure, that's poor management of your human resources. And what happens eventually is you have people who are good at this, doing this kind of work, they leave. They, they want to go over to development and do something more interesting. So separating the tasks allow, allow us to assign the right activities to the right people. And that's just plain good people management. Not that I'm a manager. In fact, I stay in academia par partially because I'm afraid a company would make me manage. But doing this separation allows us to raise our abstraction level. And then this process of test design, by being separate from dealing with values, we're just dealing with mathematical abstractions, it makes that process much, much simpler. Just like the algebra and the calculus does for traditional hard engineering fields. So this is a process that I've been talking about a while, for a while. Uh, every company I've talked to that, is, that has started trying this and every manager project has found that it helps them get more tests faster and cheaper and their employees are much, much happier in their job. And that's very important because here's another graph that shows the cost of not doing the right kind of testing at the right time. This is something I pulled out of a report from the SEI and I redrew the graph because it took me about an hour to understand their, their chart, but um, they documented a number of projects. It was, it was something like 30 or 40 projects and calculated the costs of what happened. When, when tests were found, when, uh, or when faults, faults appeared in the program, when faults were found, and the relative cost of finding and fixing the faults. So um, let me just walk you through this. The yellow here is when faults were originated, or when they were put into the program. So requirements, design, programming. Then the green here is when we were actually able to, de to detect those faults. So a lot more faults were detected during system tests, 20% uh, during program unit testing and integration testing, few during requirements, a few during, um, I'm sorry, during design, a few during requirements, and then not very many in production. But the real key are these red bars. The red bars represent the cost. So the, the yellow and the green, they're percentages. The red is, is a unit cost. So unit cost is fixed at one for finding and fixing a fault during or early, early in the process. By the time we get to integration testing, it costs about five times as much to find and fix the faults in software. By the time we get to system testing, it's 10 times. And then if a, if a fault gets through to production, like all the examples I showed a couple of slides ago, that's about 50 times the cost of finding and fixing the faults early on. They're not as many, but if we just assume something simple, $1,000 unit cost, 100 faults just to make the math easy, then we get these costs. And you can see 6K finding problems during requirements, 20K during unit testing, and then 360K and 250K. So the bulk of the cost is actually out here in system test and production. Even though there are very, relatively few faults found in production, the cost per fault is so high that the cost of 
finding those faults starts to skyrocket. So my view as a teacher and as a researcher is a big part of my job is to take these green bars over in design, program, unit, or unit testing, integration test, and pull those up by finding more faults there, and thereby taking these green bars and pushing them down so that then um, the cost starts to change. Starts to change. So these new circles are the cost if we push those down. You know, I just, I just took some estimates of how we might be able to do a better job testing. You can see that we wind up spending a little bit more money over here, but we spend a lot less money over here. So just with these not, are sort of arbitrary numbers, that's a huge cost. Roughly a, a third of, that, of, of the cost gets saved just by finding more faults earlier. That's a big win. <clears throat> now, I know companies that don't do any testing until the system level. Uh, what do we call those? We call those companies that produce bad software, right? And I know companies that spend a lot more time finding tests early, but there's a lot more we can do. So how do we, how do, we do that? How do we, do, how do we get better tests? Well, one thing that's really clear is we need better tools. When I look at the tools on the market, I, from my perspective of seeing all the research results of the last 20 years, I'm very disappointed. Almost as disappointed as I am in the quality of PowerPoint, which hasn't really improved much in the last 20 years, um, but not quite. Um, we also need to, do, to have better practices and techniques. And the interesting thing that, that I've learned about Google is that Google is doing a lot of this. Uh, a lot of companies aren't. Um, we need more education. That's partly my fault as a, as a professor. And we need different ways to organize our management strategies. The other thing that happens, a lot of testing QA teams don't have much technical knowledge. You know, how do you get on the testing QA team? Either you get a degree in sociology and you want a job, or you, know, you, you, you get hired by the developers and you're so bad they ship you off to the testing group. That's not always true, but that happens far too often. And in a, I live in a place where there are a lot of government contractors, and they're famous for doing that. They're very slow to adopt anything, any new ideas, in fact. We need more expertise. And when I compare that to development, the amount of knowledge a programmer needs today is vastly more than what a programmer need ten, needed 10 years ago. So that's been increasing, and testing knowledge required is going to be increasing the same way. We also need more specialization, like the, the chart I showed you a minute ago. Um, we had a lot of specialization and development that occurred in the 90s and earlier in this decade. That needs to happen now. And we also need to reduce the manual expense. We're doing a lot of work by hand that could be done automatically. And one of the biggies is getting the test data, going through that design process at the top of that chart, and then finding the values. That's largely done by hand right now. A lot of that could be automated. So I'm going to talk a little bit about automatic test data generation and then a couple of techniques for doing this. So I had some students look at a couple of, look at some, look, look at some tools. I'm going to mention or summarize two fairly small studies and just to give an idea of what's going on with some of the tools. So one student wanted to evaluate some, some automatic test data generators. And we had some constraints, so they had, we wanted to try it with Java programs, so that was one constraint, Java classes. Um, we wanted to, uh, uh, we didn't want to spend money on the tools because we didn't have any, so they had to be free, um, so that's a bit of a limitation. And we evaluated these by seeding mutants to represent faults and seeing how many mutants were, were killed or how many faults were killed. And we also added a couple of test criteria, random test data generation, which is really, really simple, so she wrote, it was actually partially by hand and partially with a tool that she wrote in a couple of days. And then edge coverage, which we did by hand on the control flow graphs of, of the classes. Not a, really big, not a really big study, but the results were interesting. She came to me with these results and said, uh, JCrasher is the best tool. And I said, it is. Um, there's not a lot of difference, but there is some, okay. But that's not the interesting part. And she said, what do you mean? And I said, okay, go add random testing and edge coverage. And she said, why? And I said, just, just do it. So she came back uh, a few weeks later and said, well, JCrasher is still the best. Um, edge coverage did pretty well. Random. I said, you're missing the point. What are these three tools that you got doing? 
they're doing exact, almost exactly the same that random test data generation is doing. Right? You can stand here and throw darts at a dartboard without looking and get the same results that these, that these three tools are doing or getting. But yet, here's the simplest, dumbest test criteria in edge coverage, way outperforming those. Six, eight percent isn't that impressive when you're talking about finding all the, all the mutants in a program, but it's still way better than these. So they're essentially generating random values. That's what they're doing. I had another student, ha a couple of students do a fairly similar study, but uh, with a slightly different intent. They wanted to look at different criteria. So I don't know if you know all, all those. I'm not going to spend any time describing those. There's a, I can recommend a, a, uh, an out-of-date book uh, if, if you want to read about those. Um, and we generated tests, again, for Java classes. Um, and this time, hand-seeded the faults, because one, one of the criteria we're looking at was mutation. On, again, not a huge study, and, and these were, we're looking at individual classes, so fairly low level, um, 88 faults. And this is what we found. So the green bars, um, this is how many faults out of 88 were found by edge coverage, edge pair, all uses, data flow. Prime path is a way to extract a finite number of meaningful paths from a, from a graph. And then mutation, and it, well, if you're really interested in, in test criteria and you've thought a lot about it, I think actually the most interesting thing here is this blue bar beside mutation. The blue bars represent the number of tests that were needed. And it's actually normalized so that they fit on the same graph because it was, it, they were a fair amount more than the actual or faults that were found. But the fact is we needed a lot fewer tests with mutation. And if you're familiar with the criteria, that's pretty intriguing. If you're not, don't, don't, don't worry about that. Uh, but what this means, we have some really powerful criteria. That's, that's sort of the summary. So if we look at these two studies, I mean, they can't be compared directly, but we can sort of summarize them together. We have some test data generators that are out there that really aren't very good. And they're, all three of those are, are widely used, by the way. We found many dozens of companies that are using those, thinking they're good tools. Edge coverage is the, one of the weakest criteria that we've ever developed, um, but it's much better than any of those tests. So ooh, we have a long way to go. The hardest part was generating those test values. Okay, and the good thing for me out of, this, out of these studies is that we need to test better, and we know how. We're not using all the ideas for how, but we actually know how to test better. Uh, so that leads me to one way uh, for getting the test values. That was the hardest part, is getting the values. This is an idea that's been around a while um, called dynamic domain reduction. So what does that mean? Well, automatic test data generation tries to find inputs that will be effective at finding faults. There are two, there are two things that a test data generator has to do. It has to satisfy the syntax requirements on the inputs, the right, the right uh, range of values, the right type. I mean, it has to put an integer for an integer, for example, and some semantic goals like a coverage criterion or uh, what it, whatever you, you want your tests to do on the program. If you're a theoretician, this is all, all of these problems are formally undecidable. Um, so that frustrates the theoretical people a lot. I don't think it matters to somebody who wants to test software. The syntax depends on the kind of level we're testing. So satisfying syntax requirements for unit testing is very different than for, for system testing. Right? We have well-defined parameters for methods, for method calls in a class, but we have a very different input language for something like PowerPoint. Uh, semantic goals also can vary from I want a, some random values, maybe I want special values or invalid values, or I have a test criterion I want to satisfy. I'm going to talk about this one method that is really applied for, for unit testing to satisfy some test criteria. And this work, this research actually started way back in the late 70s uh, with Fortran and Pascal, fun individual functions with a method called symbolic execution, which is now used quite widely in compilers for things like optimization. Uh, and they would create constraints that describe values and then use something like linear programming to solve those constraints. So this worked pretty well on very small functions and usually didn't quite satisfy something as simple as statement coverage. And 
I don't know if you can probably can't read this, but if you want to look at the slides later, those are some references to some early papers. I think the first one I found was 1975. So this started a while ago. Then in the early 90s, we came up with some better techniques, some heuristics for solving the constraints instead of the LP solvers, which had some really severe limitations. Some, some better algorithms that were called a symbolic evaluation instead of execution. It's a kind of a subtle difference that led to, allowed us to test larger functions. Edge coverage got easy. Uh, data flow, we started, we started doing pretty well on that and reasonably, reasonably good on, on mutation. This is actually when I came into this research area uh, as a PhD student. Then later in the 90s, um, we developed a, an idea called dynamic symbolic um, evaluation. Uh, now there's a, there's a concept called concolic, which is the same idea, but a new idea, something, combination of concurrent and symbolic, I think. Um, that's, that you, may have, you may have heard that name. And then a, a technique I'm going to tell you about called dynamic domain reduction, which solves the constraints in a fairly effective and efficient way. And this allowed us to handle things like loops, which we couldn't before, arrays, pointers, anytime you put things on the stack and give very high mutation scores. So these other test criteria were solved pretty easily. And now we actually give very high mutation scores. <clears throat> so let me, I'll, I'm gonna talk about dynamic domain reduction, but th the thing that's happening now in this area is people looking at using search-based procedures like genetic algorithms, et cetera. Those have promise, and I'll tell you why in a second. They're, based, they're a lot simpler. It's, they may scale higher, but they haven't actually, they're doing about as well as these techniques did right now. So they haven't, they haven't really gotten, gotten that solidly good, good yet. So let me walk you through dynamic domain reduction. Um, the, the problem with the previous techniques before this is that they would get these systems of constraints that would explode very quickly. And reasonably large computers would, would start to run out of virtual memory. So you were pretty limited in the size of the methods you could, you could test uh, because it would, the systems of constraints that described the tests we needed were described completely. Do, do, dynamic domain reduction is, says instead of keeping all the, con, instead of generating all the constraints, then satisfying them, we're going to satisfy them on the fly. Um, so it's a, it's a more dynamic approach. So for each input variable, we define some in input domain, so that's the, the, the range of values that it needs to have, okay? So for an integer, maybe negative max n to max n, or zero to 100, depending on, depending on the problem. Then we pick a test path. So instead of solving all test paths at once, we solve one test path at a time. Then we walk through that path, symbolically evaluating it, and at each step, instead of keeping the constraints, we use the constraint to reduce the domain of one or more of the variables and throw that constraint away that tells us how to take that edge. Uh, we hit expressions, we evaluate those with um, some domain symbolic algorithms that also reduce the domains of the variables. And when we finish, if we have values, we know for certain those values will ensure that that path is executed. If it's empty, then we have to reevaluate the, the path. We may have to make different decisions. L let me show an example. This is a really simple example, very small method that takes three integers and decides which one is in the middle. Uh, so we start with initial guess, and we have a lot of decisions. If y is greater than or equal to z, we go this way. y less than z, we go that way. So let's, let's start with our initial domains. And just to make it simple, I, I've centered these around 0 from negative 10 to 10, three, three integer variables. Um, and let's pick a path. So let's say we want to take this path 1 to 2 to 3 to 5 to 10. So we want an input that will take that path. That comes out of a test requirement. We have to get down to here. Uh, so how do we do that? Well, we start with the first branch. To take this first branch from 1 to 2, y has to be greater than z. So we adjust the, the symbolic domains of the variables, y and z, so that all of the possible variables satisfy that constraint. And we do something by that's called choosing a split point. So in this case, we choose right in the middle so that both variables are balanced with approximately the same number of possible values. 
So we split on zero. So then y's domain is now negative 10 to zero. Z's domain is one to 10. And so all of the values in here will ensure that I take this edge. That's a guess, right? We chose a value to split on, and it may have been a wrong choice. So if we get to the bottom, we don't have any solutions, we have to go back up and we make a different decision. So this has some built-in searching process. And <clears throat> the decision and the algorithm that we built was use something called interpolation out of numerical analysis, where you guess in the middle, then halfway between the beginning and the middle, then halfway between the middle and the end, and you keep bisecting it until, until you find something or you run out of, you run out of effort, um, or you run out of energy to, to, to keep searching. It doesn't always work, okay? Uh, but it always terminates. And if it works, we know we have a good solution. So then the next branch is two to three. X is greater than or equal to Y. We choose another split point for X and Y, negative five in this case. So now X's domain is reduced to negative five to 10. Y's domain is negative 10 to five. We choose another. We take the next edge is three to five. X is less than Z. Than Z. We choose another split point, leaving this domain, negative five to two, negative 10 to negative five, and three to 10. Um, and then the last edge, five to 10, is always taken, so there's no constraint or decision associated with that. So our final result is this set of domains here, and any value from those will ensure that that path is executed. For example, zero, negative 10, eight. So this works when you have paths where a relatively large number of values will, uh, will satisfy that path. This is a very efficient algorithm when that's true. If only a small number of values will find that path, you have a good chance of finding it, but sometimes you need to do more searching. So for example, if you have a decision that says if x equals five, then you have to set x to five at that point, which is a very small domain, and that may cause interference with the other variables that it may be compared with later, okay? Um, but, you, but it does eventually terminate, and it actually works very, very well for methods with 50 to 100 lines, which is actually a fairly large method by today's standards. Um, not a system level technique, a unit level technique. Uh, okay, so this, the, the hard part about this, and I didn't get into the issues of loops and pointers and arrays, that makes it more complicated, but these algorithms ha have ways to deal with those. Again, not complete, not assured that we'll always find a solution, but if we find a solution, it always works. Uh, they're very complicated algorithms, but they're actually very, very powerful. And I've seen, there may be more, but I've seen four companies try to build commercial tools based on kind of similar algorithms, if not these. Two of them, they failed. They couldn't get the algorithms written correctly, and they generate what are essentially random values. One I got a chance to analyze very carefully on a, on a consulting, and some problem is they couldn't make a business case, which was lucky for Google because the founder of Agitar now works for Google and makes funny videos, that one of which you saw yesterday. Um, and the tool is now owned by McCabe Software, and I, they, won't let me ha they won't let me look at it. There's also a tool that Microsoft is developing called PEX. I haven't actually used this, but from the descriptions and the research papers and the like, it's actually, it's very similar, it's using similar technologies. But I don't know the details. The search-based procedures that are being worked on now, they're much easier. The algorithms are much easier to build. So as an example, the, the tool that implemented dynamic domain reduction was significantly harder to build than a compiler. Okay, so this, this is not simple stuff, and not a little bit harder, but significantly harder than, than a compiler for language like Java. Um, so, but we're looking at, you know, easier algorithms, but, but they're still less effective. Uh, the problem with this approach is nobody's, found, nobody's yet found a way to make a business model work out of selling these kind of tools, partly because it's, it's really hard to build these tools. So another question is, that works for, for Java classes. What can we do at a sort of a higher level? For example, if we want to test web applications and generate test data automatically. I came on to this question through an idea called input validation testing. So in input validation testing, 
you have some domain of inputs that the software is expecting, and you want to make sure that the software processes those inputs correctly and not inputs out of, the, out of that domain, or at least it deals with them in an appropriate manner. It shouldn't crash, it shouldn't return incorrect results if you give it a value outside of the valid range. Um, so if you're a wise programmer, you check your inputs before you use them, right? And what I say wise programmer because there are good programmers who don't, uh, but wise programmers do, because if you don't, eventually it'll, it'll cause problems. And there's some interesting, there are some hard questions in this. How do you recognize invalid inputs? And then if you find an invalid input, what should you do with it? Right? Should you just throw it back to the user and say, I don't like this, do something different? And there are some other options you can have. That's not really, really what, what I'm focusing on. Um, it turns out it's not hard to validate input, but it's really easy to get it wrong. And some of it's practical. Some of it's really very fundamental. And here's, here's something that makes it really hard to check my inputs. And I think of this in terms of how do we represent the input domain? I think about goal domains, right? A goal domain is what we want to have. And they're often very irregular. So if you think about a credit card, what's a valid credit card number? It's more complicated than we might think. The first digit identifies the industry. And there's some digits that are valid, some that aren't. Uh, the first six digits uh, and the length specify who issued the card. The final digit is a check digit, so there's a formula for all the previous digits that should yield the check digit as, as its last um, as its last digit, um, and then all the other digits specify your account, a specific account. Thanks for turning off the, the air conditioner. I think my voice feels better now. Um, so there, if you're interested, there are more details in that link. That's where I got these details. So that's the goal domain, but what do we often see in the specification? Somebody writes down, well, we need you to check that the first digit is in is, is one of these, and the length is between 13 and 16, which is American Express and Visa. Uh, what's the common implemented domain? What do programmers usually do? They check to see all digits are numeric. All digits are numeric. That's what we usually, that's what most software checks for. Not even, not even this thing. And by the way, this isn't fully correct. So if you're, if you're traveling on a military ID, uh, there are lots of Lots of websites you can't use because I think the first digit is seven. Maybe it's two. It's either two or seven. And a lot, lot of web applications won't accept that, that number as being valid. Uh, so how do we represent these? Well, sort of at an abstract level, our desired inputs or our goal domain, it's kind of irregular, right? There are all sorts of bumps and nooks and crannies in the region. The specified domain is similar, but you know, there are valid values that are not accepted, and there are, in, and there are um, invalid values that are accepted. And then we have what programmers often do, a very smooth circle to make the software very simple. Or all the digits integer, which is close, but it's not exactly right. So as a tester, what does that mean? We have this region around the edge of our input domains where we can expect to find a lot of problems. And this led, to, led me to this idea I call by bypass testing. Oh, and by the way, we also find a lot of security vulnerabilities here. Sort of a, an accidental side effect that I, that I didn't think about until somebody pointed out to me at a conference. So what is bypass testing? Well, if you think about when you're using a web application, we're sitting here on my client, I'm sending sensitive data to a server, my credit card number, my address, et cetera. Uh, and it's being checked partially on my client, partially on the server, right? So there's some checks in the HTML and in JavaScript running on, on my computer. If bad data gets through to the server, all sorts of bad things can happen. The database might be corrupted, the server might crash, we might have security issues. And the thing is, when I'm doing it, I'm okay. But there are bi bad guys out there who might bypass all the checks out here that have the ability to do that and send malicious data onto the server. And by the way, my next door neighbor works for the CIA, and he has assured me, yes, Bin Laden is a Mac guy. He hasn't updated in a while. It's hard to buy the newest, the newest technology when you're living in a cave, but he is, he is a Mac guy. 
Um, then we have maybe these botnets or crazy people thinking, let's see what I can do. And, you know, other kind of dangerous people sending malicious data. Uh, sometimes on purpose, sometimes accidentally. The point is we can bypass all the checks on the client. A lot of that's done with JavaScript or with HTML. Um, users can turn all that off, right? I can disable the JavaScript. I can modify the HTML. Um, and what bypass testing does is it does that to intentionally validate as many validation constraints as possible. Um, the first way this happened is when we're out, one of, one of my students was, was uh, automating some tests of web application, uh, I think using HTTP unit, and came to me and said, should I embed the JavaScript in the HTTP unit? And I thought, ooh, wait a minute, there's my input validation. It was one of those light bulbs. I thought, oh, you don't have to run the JavaScript. We're bypassing all of that. So this validates whether the input validation is done well. It also checks how robust the software, and there's some security evaluation. This is not a complete security solution, but there's something there. Um, so it, one of the things, so the first paper was, I mentioned here, um, I had a master's student do a, build a tool and do a case study on a bunch of, on a bunch of web applications. So how does this, so we'll look at the data. How does this work? Well, first, we look at the visible input restrictions. So that's on the client in a web app, right? The HTML tags, you know, if it's a radio button, that specifies the values that can, that can come in. And the attributes, right? The, you can specify the length, for example, of a text field. Those are HTML attributes that's, that restrict the input domain. And then we have checks in JavaScript running on the client. <clears throat> then we model these as constraints on the input. They said, okay, we've specified in HTML that, that this field can only have the value 20, 30, or 40, because that's what the radio button values are. So we describe these as constraints or model those. Then we intentionally violate those constraints. So instead of 20, 30, 40, we send in 0 or 100. And we have some rules for violating the constraints that are sort of mutation-like, if you're familiar with mutation. And it's easy to tune this to get more tests or fewer tests, right? more violations, fewer violations, depending on how much effort you want to put into your testing. Then these are encoded into some sort of test evaluation framework, like HTTP unit or Selenium, whatever. And that framework bypasses all of these checks, right? Because you're not sending it through the user interface, through the HTML. You're sending it through, uh, through, a, through a call from a Java program running on, on your client that is sent to the server. So I had a master's student build a tool to implement this. And he came to me and said, what should I, okay, the tool's running. It doesn't do everything we want, but it does a lot of it. What should I try this on? And I said, we don't need the source, right? No, we just need the URL to the front end of the program. And I said, try it on some commercial websites. And he said, well, which ones? And I said, which ones do you use? And he said, well, I use a bank, I use Google, I use Amazon. I said, okay, go try it on all of those. And as he left the room, I said, oh, Vasilios, whatever you do, don't log in. And he said, why not? And he said, well, what happens if uh, your program uh, causes the bank to dump a million dollars into your account? And he said, oh, that's, that's not so good, because they'd come get me, wouldn't they? And I said, yeah, don't log in. Um, so let, let me just describe these results. Um, so let's start on the right here. Uh, the, short, the short story is the blue is good, the red is bad. So the blue is valid responses. The red is some sort of invalid response. Um, and I didn't cook this, by the way. I didn't make, I, I'm not trying to flatter anybody. Google turned out looking very, very good. This was the main search engine page and some options. We didn't try Google Mail, so I don't know if that's as good. Amazon did very well. Uh, our cable company wasn't too bad. My service is bad, but their software works pretty well. But then if we kind of go down here, here's his life insurance company. Uh, about 70% of the tests we ran found some kind of failure. 70%. This is production software, been deployed, been used for a while. 70% uh, of the tests found a problem. No matter how you measure your tests, 70% of your tests finding a problem is spectacular efficiency, right? As a tester, you're jumping up and down. I know how to find faults in software. Um, but this was 
we weren't, this wasn't under test. This is way past test. Um, the details over here, we divided up into fault and failure where it, the software accepted the, the bad inputs and did something with it. And then exposure where it crashed and sent a message back that said, you know, error in line 25 of program, blah, 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 blah. As, a, as most users find that annoying and frustrating and we go to another company. But uh, the bad guys, that's information they use to crack into the system. So that's, that's actually a really bad thing. Um, so, you know, here's, here's some other examples. The, his bank was uh, 12 or 13 percent of the test found errors. That's not that many, except that's a bank. And he didn't log in, right? So there are some things he wasn't able to test. So because we didn't log in, this is kind of conservative. The other thing that's conservative about this study is we didn't have access to the back end, right? Remember the, Bob's discussion of observability yesterday. Web applications have somewhat low observability because it's hard to see what happens in the database and other back end you know, storage artifacts, memory or, or long-term storage. Uh, we didn't have access to that, so we may, some of these tests may have done bad things that we don't know about, so they may have found actually more faults um, than, than showed up in our study. We weren't working with the companies, we were just using their software uh, and found all, all these faults. So what this tells me is we have a lot of really bad web app software out there. We, we worked with a, a company, Avaya, to uh, help them learn how to implement this in their process um, uh, a, a year or so later. So they had some production-ready software, software that was finished. They turned it over to production, which put it in the right package, figured out how to deploy it, and pushed it out to all the customers. And the software is something that would notify people of problems on a phone switching network. So it had algorithms for who to notify and how to notify them. Um, again, the tests here are invalid inputs, and we expect some kind of exceptional behavior, not some not just a success. Uh, we didn't, again, we didn't check the back end. And we went through six of their screens for this software and generated um, this many tests for each of the screen, total of 184 tests. Uh, 92 of them failed, 63 unique failures. So 33% of the tests found problems. <clears throat> they thought they were finished testing. The interesting thing is the developer was very pissed off. And he spent a lot of time yelling that nobody would actually give inputs like this, so they didn't have to worry about it. And the manager, uh, 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 fix it. Um, so this is, no matter how, how you count that up, six, one third of your tests founding, finding failures, that's a very effective testing. Okay, so how do we get this? So here are a couple of ideas that haven't really got, gotten much traction in industry. I mean, one's, uh, 15 years old, one's just a few years old. Um, they, they, they haven't been used a lot, but how, how do we get there? I was on a panel at a conference uh, a couple of years ago, and we are tasked with coming up with reasons why some of the ideas and testing aren't being more widely used. And we came up with these four. So lack of test education. There's a, there's a guy out in um, uh, West Coast somewhere, Washington State. He has some small company out there. That, has a, that, that was quoted in an article as saying, half of our engineers are testers. Our programmers spend half of their time testing. I don't know if that's an exaggeration or not, but that's a lot of testing effort. Three, he says that three quarters of Microsoft's time is spent on testing. There's some, I heard some character at a conference last year um, tell me that people at his company, it's some search company, they, look for, they help people look for things, uh, goggle something. Um, he's, he claimed that they spent half their time um, doing unit testing. That's a lot of testing. I teach at a university in the US. You know how many US universities require undergraduate computer science to study testing? Zero. Yeah, and this is something like 3,000 institutions of higher learning. A lot of computer science departments. None of them require a class on testing. What about master's degrees in computer science? Zip, yeah. No university in North America requires software testing to get a bachelor's or a master's in computer science. But yet these guys say that that's, that's, half, that's going to be half their job when they graduate. But what do we teach them? We teach them one, you know, 
week-long lecture about, about, in a semester-long class, about how to test based on books that were written 20, 30 years ago. So they don't learn anything about testing, in fact. Um, you know how many undergraduate testing classes there are in the U.S.? About 30. We actually did a survey in 205 and found 15. Um, and that was, I th I'm pretty confident that was reasonably close. There are more now, three or four are being created every year, but that's still a tiny number compared to the universities. Interestingly, when I ask my students in my graduate classes how many people took a class in, in testing as an undergraduate, uh, more than a quarter of them say they did. And uh, guess which quarter? People from India. So universities in India seem to be teaching testing. And about half of our students at my university, or graduate students, are now from India. So a lot of them actually took a class in testing. But none of the people who studied in the US. So that's one problem. We don't teach people how to test, and so they're not doing a very good job in a lot of cases. Another problem is the process. When you adopt new strategies, you have to change a process, and that's really expensive, especially for a big company. Most of the companies that are using these ideas are sort of small startup companies. It's really hard to change the process, especially in a big, in a, in, in a big um, company. Another problem is a lot of the tools we have are really hard to use. And, and companies buy the tools, and two or three people use them, and then they get stuck on the shelf and they get dusty. Um, what's the, the only tool that's widely used for software testing is JUnit, right? That was, I'm sure it's by far the most widely used tool, and probably by a lot. Uh, but for a lot of these, you actually have to know the theory. You have to take a graduate course in software testing to use a lot of the tools. That's just poor usability. So I drive a car all the time. I don't know how that engine works. Why should I know how a testing tool works? We have a lot of people programming that have no idea how a compiler works. Why do you have to know how a testing tool works to use a testing tool? Because the usability was designed poorly. And then the other thing, you know, I talked about this a little bit with my examples. We have a lot of very bad tools. Tools that just aren't effective. They don't do very much. But people don't know it. They actually think they're pretty good. And one of the key technical problems is generating those test values. And very few tools help you design or generate test values. Right? That's a major issue. So something like JUnit, it's a box. It's a very useful box. But it's a box. What do you put in that box? Well, you put in, hopefully, good tests. How do you get good tests? Well, we do that by a very slow process, everything by hand. Why haven't we seen more automatic test data generation? Well, the tools are either very weak or they're really hard to use. They're very hard to develop. And, um, you know, Agitar found out companies don't want to pay for this. They, they haven't concluded that the return on investment in this kind of tool is worth it to their bottom line. The data that I've seen out of SCI and this shows otherwise, that that, that, that is a good return on investment. Another issue is, is folks like me, we want theoretical perfection. When I first saw Agitar, uh, Agitator, I thought, <laughs> they're ignoring all the theory, right? They're not solving all of, the, all of the criteria. They're just making guesses. And it really bothered me. And then I looked at the results and I thought, but they're creating really good tests. And I thought, well, but they're skipping all the theory. But, you know, they're creating really good tests. And the engineer in me finally said, that's a good thing creating good tests, and I read that. I found this little book. I don't know if any of you all saw this. Um, the Way of Testivus. Let me just open this up and randomly, oh, an imperfect test today is better than a perfect test someday. And most, most academics just can't accept that. That's a pretty good book. You know, I'm going to throw my book away and use this book. Uh, it won't take my students very long to read it either. That's, that's good. Okay, that's all my props. Uh, so the testers have to understand all this stuff, and that's just too much. What do practical testers want? I, had a, I gave a talk last year that said, it was titled, Testers Ain't Mathematicians. Um, ain't is sort of my vernacular from Appalachia for it, are not. I don't know, I don't know, if, I don't know if you use ain't in, in India. Um, but testers ain't mathematicians, and it's true. They're not, and they don't want to be. And we shouldn't expect them or require them to be. But that process, the model-driven test design process, allows one mathematician to serve a lot of testing. 
So you need not very many mathematicians, and the rest don't have to be. So what do we need? We need to integrate AT, automatic test data generation with development. The unit, test, the unit level tools have to be designed for developers and be easy to use, and they have to give good tools, but uh, as Testavis tells us, not perfect, te not perfect tests. So here's what I think a unit level tool should look like for automatic test data generation. Uh, first, this user should not have to know much about testing because they're programmers. They don't want to be testers. Second, it should ignore all those theoretical problems. <clears throat> it took me a while to be able to say that out loud, but I've, I've made progress. Uh, it should just ignore those. It's engineering, right? It's not science. Um, it has to integrate with IDE. So if you're using Eclipse, it should be an Eclipse plugin. It should automate with some test framework like JUnit or well, if you have another favorite test, test framework, that's fine. And the process should be finding faults is semantic problems in your software is the same as finding the syntactic problems. Compilers come back and tell you your syntax mistakes. Why don't they tell you your semantic mistakes as well? They're not going to find all of them because we're ignoring all these completeness and feasibility, but they can find a lot of them very quickly, especially sort of the basic ones. Um, so after my, my Java class compiles cleanly, or C++ if you're you know, working in the 90s, then the automatic test data generator should kick in and start and produce tests, automate them, run them, compare them against an expected value, and come back and show the results to the programmer and say, okay, here's your next set of problems that you get to deal with. So then you can start debugging. Um, it's not going to find all the problems. That's not going to be complete. But then we can move those bars up of, you know, during unit testing and move the system testing job down. So we have fewer problems to deal with at the system level. At the system level, well, we should be able to generate tests based on the input domain. We should pull that out of the user interface. We should not need the source, right? And the tests have, should be automated. But we have to have a way for humans to come in and add some tests. And I have been starting a collection of faults I found in software that I don't think any criteria could find. And um, I have a few. I, I'm not going to go into those because, you know, the next guys want to talk soon. Um, but you have to have a way for the humans to come in and add additional tests for things that the criteria are blind to. If we can integrate that together where there's a language the human can put in test requirements that then gets satisfied automatically, that reduces a lot of that manual effort as well, saving money. So the process, as soon as I integrate my system, check in everything to the library, then those tests are created and run. It should be part of the integration tool. So instead of making the testers do all the work, it should support the testers. Oops. Uh, allowing them to do you know, the work that requires a, a human brain. Uh, so here's the sort of the global issue of test design. We have human-based test design where you have knowledge of the domain, the testing and intuition, and you have to generate values. Then we have criteria-based design where we use engineering principles to, to cover, you know, generate values that cover things like the source or requirements. A lot of people go around saying that you have to do one or the other, and the other is wrong. And in fact, I did that for a while. Then I heard a talk by a guy who I really associated with human-based testing, and I thought, oh, he never makes any sense. And I heard this talk, and I kept thinking, he makes sense, but he's wrong. But boy, this talk really makes sense, but I know he's wrong. And I finally realized he's not wrong. I was wrong. And maybe he was wrong because there's actually room for both. So Ken, Kim Kaner actually improved my view of testing enormously by teaching me that these are actually both. He doesn't, I'm not sure if he knows that. I didn't tell him that. Um, but there's no reason to be competitive. We actually need both. So to be able to test efficiently and effectively, or effectively and efficiently, we have to be cooperative with the two. Um, and that's actually pretty, pretty hard to do. So to summarize this, researchers like me, we always want perfect solutions. We took all this theory in computer science undergrad. Right, we had to take three semesters of calculus, four or five other math classes, automata theory, Algorithms, so we think theory is important, but you know, we're teaching, what's the degree they get? Computer science, 
What's the job they get? Software engineering. I think we're teaching them all wrong. We need less theory, more engineering, and industry needs engineering tools, and they need engineers. Uh, so we actually need to teach more of that engineering kind of thing. And you know, the bottom line is we've got some really good ideas for automatically generating test data. It's ready for transition. And I think the tools should be free, and preferably open source. Uh, I haven't seen anybody go to that much effort. The hard part is it's a lot of effort. It's not, and building JUnit for free was much easier than building something like this. That's, that's, a, major, that's a major headache. So uh, my contact information and, um, you know, as far as I know, this book has never been used to make diapers. Um, and I tried to find one in my trash can, but I think uh, it had already been recycled. So I, was, I, th I think that, that uh, Alberto really did throw my book away because I had one. Okay, so I'm done. Do I have time for questions? Or I should ask the next speakers. So we'll, we'll just do a couple of questions um, because we are running short of time. Uh, maybe you guys can take the questions later offline. Yeah, Jeff, uh, yeah. so uh, automated test data generation, uh, mutation, and data constraints, uh, these are essential parts of fuzzing. And most of fuzzing is always done at system level rather than uh, at, at a right. unit level. So I would like to understand how your uh, concepts of test data generation, mutation, et cetera, translate into the fuzzing uh, domain. Uh, that's, that's an interesting question because um, the ideas of fuzzing, they've been around for, for years. I mean, they're, it, it's, it comes out of, turn, out of the concepts we've had for things like mutation and um, uh, uh, general rules for violating the input domains, right, in, in, invalid values, stress testing, things like that. Um, and suddenly there is this term fuzz testing. Nobody knew the previous ideas, but suddenly everybody knows fuzz testing. So what's the, I mean, that's what fuzz testing is. It's using these ideas, but it's a, it's a kind of a cooler term, right? Just like the ideas for JUnit. I mean, I was having students build projects like that in the 80s um, as class projects, not as sophisticated as JUnit, mind you, but the same, the same basic idea. And they weren't being used until somebody came up with this really cool name and they started marketing, marketing it heavily, uh, called JUnit. So, so yeah, that's, that's what fuzz testing is. And concolic testing is the same ideas of symbolic, dynamic symbolic testing with, with a little bit of tris that they use some assertions in a slightly different way, and it actually works better than some of these ideas was developed more recently. And so fuzz testing is associated with concolic testing as well. But it, it's, the same, it's the same thing. Yeah. The, the reason I ask this question is that uh, uh, what you demonstrated in that the flow of the code is known so that the data constraints can be known, and then you, you can come up with the efficient test data. Right. In fuzzing, only the protocol which the data follows is known, not the code which is going to process that. Right. The way you demonstrated about web applications, we don't know what is happening on the other side. So, yeah, so, so, so I was under, uh, trying to understand that how your concepts of automated test data generation, your algorithms, could help in automated test data generation when only the protocol is known. For example, you could do network protocol fuzzing, you could do file fuzzing, so is there any translation, is there any research work done on that? Well, the fuzzing actually looks a lot more like the, like the bypass testing ideas than the dynamic domain reduction. You're right, you, you, need, the, you need some structure like the code for that. Uh, but, but the bypass testing, you don't. Um, so the, the fuzzing is, is semi-formalized rules for, for, creating, for, for creating data. If that can be encoded in something more specific with rules for what, what the values look like, which is not hard, and I've seen a couple of papers that actually did that, then it, those are rules that you can start to embed in a tool and create the values. And so there are ideas in fuzzing that, that aren't in the papers that we have on bypass testing, but they can, they can be used in exactly the same way. And there's, I mean, you can also have some randomization where you have some rules where I take a value and I randomly change it in ways. And that's, sometimes that, that can be very effective. And in fact, Agitator, 
did some of that when it was having trouble going down a path, it would randomly change some of the values uh, that got close to the path it wanted and often get down that path. And then there are search procedures that actually do that in more clever ways, uh, that use the path constraints as, uh, as part of the optimization functions or as part of the, part of the solution for things like genetic algorithms. Yeah, but, oh. Uh, you mentioned it uh, rather uh, glibly that uh, after the data is generated, of course, then there are expected results. Uh, where do those expected results come from? <laughs> so he's asking in these techniques, where do the expected results come from? Uh, that's actually pretty hard. Some of those you're, you're going to have to have, a, have the person decide. There's a fair amount of research going on right now to see if with these kind of techniques at the unit testing level, can I come up with uh, expected output or, or at least approximate expected output? Um, but that's a problem that has not been fully solved. At the bypass testing level, it's actually much simpler to, to come up with expected output because the expected behaviors, you get a message that says something like this value is not bad. But at the, detail, at the unit level, that's that's much harder. Just a follow-up question on bypass testing. Yeah. What was the failure? Was that getting a 403? Uh, failure was either not getting a 403 or not getting a message that said uh, your data was invalid. So, so it behaved as if it was normal behavior, as, as, if, as, as if it was valid data. That, that was, a, that, that was a invalid behavior. Was there another question or should we go on? Okay, well, again, thank you all for having me, and I'm looking forward to the rest of the talks. <laughs>